Hey guys, this is Peter with the Command Valley bringing you another Commander Deck Tech. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video. If you want to check out their new and improved store and support the channel while doing it, check out the affiliate link in the description below. We have a copy and pasteable deck list in the description that you can paste right into their new deck builder and buy your singles there. If you want to support the channel directly, head on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley to sign up today. We're continuing with our Commander Legends deck techs, and today we are going to build Yurlock of the Scorched Thrash. Yurlock is a legendary creature via Shino Shaman. He costs one, a black, a red, and a green. He's a 4-4 with Vigilance and says a player losing unspent mana causes that player to lose that much life. And then you can pay one, tap him, and each player adds black, red, green to their mana pool. This has been cited by many as the second coming of mana burn. Okay, not really, but I've heard a lot of voices really, really excited to see mana burn introduced in some form of a new commander. And I think this is the perfect form for a commander that would do that and bring mana burn back to the format. He gives everyone mana when he taps, which is something unusual on any card, and he brings back a rule that hasn't been in magic for about a decade now. I talked with one of our veteran patrons, Matt, to get some ideas on what mana burn players used to play back in the good old days when it was around in standard, and we've brewed up a pretty solid Jund mana burn deck. One of the first possible since 10 years ago when the mana burn rule was removed from the game. So besides using mana burn to our advantage, what's the strategy here? We're going to give everyone a lot of mana. So much mana that they won't know what to do with it. We're going to have our own ways of spending that mana, including a lot of mana sinks and untapped shenanigans for your lock, and we're going to make sure that the rest of the table feels the burn. Let's get started with some of the ways that we're going to give mana to everyone else. Now, this comes in a couple of forms, and the first section here is going to be about things that force other players to get mana or penalizing them for not tapping their lands. So we'll start with Magus of the Vineyard and Eladomri's Vineyard, both of which have the same effect, giving two green to each player at the beginning of their pre-combat main phase. Similarly, Shizuku Caller of Autumn gives three mana at the beginning of turn, but that mana doesn't empty until the end of their turn. But if they don't have a way to use it, then that punishes them. Next, we have Citadel of Pain and Power Surge. Both basically say that for each untapped land the player controls on their turn, they will take a damage, which means that if they don't tap their lands to cast spells and such, then they're going to take that mana burn damage anyways. This incentivizes people to tap all of their lands to cast spells and empty their hands and things like that. But also, if they tap too many of their lands, they're still going to take that damage from your lock. Next, we have Elemental Resonance which is an enchantment, it can enchant any permanent, and then at the beginning of the pre-combat main phase, add mana equal to that enchanted permanent's mana cost to your mana pool, including the colors that they get. So that mana is going to be somewhat helpful to whoever we give it to, because it's going to be in their colors, but they're probably going to have too much mana if we choose something with an especially high mana cost, and it's going to help us with that burn strategy, especially if they don't have anything in their hand. And last, we have Belby Corrupted Observer, a new legendary creature from Commander Legends that costs a black and a green, and it says at the beginning of each player's post-combat main phase, that player adds two colorless for each of your opponents who lost life this turn. Now, it may be a little bit difficult for us to do that ourselves in our deck. With Belby out, we are primarily going to be counting on that mana being generated by things that your opponents are doing on their turn. We do have a couple of ways to deal damage directly to people before the post-combat main phase, but primarily our damage is based around that mana burn and, and the end of turn, beginning of turn sort of shenanigans we can do with that. So Belby is a good option for some extra taxes for your opponents dealing damage to each other. And it will help us get some more mana to get our pieces going faster as well. Next, let's talk about our taxes, which are basically just 
I've kind of lumped in all of the things that punish other players for tapping lots of lands, having lots of mana, things like that to help accelerate our mana burn. So the first two are Dosan the Falling Leaf and City of Solitude. These ones are basically your grand abolishers in your Jund colors. They make sure that your opponents cannot cast spells during your turn. That means you can tap your lock all you want, make a ton of mana, make them take a ton of mana, and then if they don't have some sort of an outlet, some sort of a mana sink that's already on the board, then they're stuck with that mana and they have to take the burn. Next is War's Toll, an all-star in this deck. It says whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, tap all lands that player controls, and additionally, if a creature they control attacks, all of their creatures attack. And so when they're casting a spell, they are forced to use all of the mana that they have available, and with some other cards in our deck, that's going to give them a lot more mana than they need. Next we have Mana Bars, which will do one damage whenever anyone taps a land, which is very, very punishing. It's also going to be punishing for us, but fortunately we can get around that by using your lock instead of our lands for the majority of our mana. Next we have Blood Moon, because making everybody else's non-basic lands into mountains will mean that they can cast less stuff naturally, unless we're playing against mono red decks and then it's not really a good matchup. But if they are unable to get the colors of mana that they need, they won't be able to cast their stuff. And that means that they're going to have more mana in their mana pool at the end of their turn. And last here, not really related to mana burn, but we have Sulfuric Vortex, which is an enchantment that does two damage to each player at the start of their turn and makes it so they can't gain any life. This is mainly to, if we're up against life gain decks, that they can't recover from all of the mana burn damage that we're going to need to get through. Next, let's talk about our mana doublers, and these are really important because we want to take advantage of as much mana as we can and give everyone else more mana than they need. The ones that affect your lock the most are Nyx Bloom Ancient and Mana Reflection. Both of those will triple or double the mana production of any permanent that we tap, which means not only our lands will be doubled, but also our creatures that produce mana. Similarly, Leyline of Abundance will give us an extra green mana when we tap your lock, which means we're netting three mana instead of just two every time we activate him. We have a whole bunch of these mana doublers that will double the mana production of every player, not just us. Those include Zerta Ancient, Gauntlet of Power, Heartbeat of Spring, and Mana Flare. Each of these does the same thing. It'll basically double the mana production from any one of these players, except for Gauntlet of Power will only double the mana production of a certain kind of color. But all of these should accelerate us towards the goal of our opponents having too much mana to deal with. And then we have Seedborn Muse, which technically quadruples our mana, but basically it lets us untap all of our permanents at the end of every end step, which means that we can continue to retap your lock on every player's turn and continue that mana burn through everyone's turn. And if we have some more mana doublers, that helps even more to bring on the burn. All right, we've talked enough about giving mana to other players. Let's talk about how we're going to deal with all of this mana when it comes our way, because we're affected by that mana burn too. So we have a whole bunch of mana sinks. And if you have your lock on the battlefield, you should also have a mana sink because you're going to want a way to get rid of lots and lots of mana that comes your way. And if you're unfamiliar with a mana sink, let me show you Cavalier of Flame. He has a lot of text on him, including some card advantage and some direct damage when he dies. But the important piece of text here is that first ability, one in a red, creatures you control get plus one plus zero and gain haste until end of turn. The important thing here is that we can sink as much mana as we want into this, continuing to activate it over and over again, pumping up all of our creatures, but that's not really the relevant part. The important part is that we're spending the mana that we're generating, which will not cause us to take that mana burn damage. Our next one is Teamer Sabertooth, which has an ability that lets us return a creature to our hand, and if we do, it gains indestructible until end of turn. 
This is a very good mana sink because we don't have to return a creature to our hands if we don't want to. It is a May ability, and so we can just pump as much mana as we want to this and never activate it. It is also helpful to have Teamer Sabretooth on the battlefield if someone is targeting your lock. We can tap it to generate that mana, use Teamer Sabretooth to bring your lock back to our hand, and then we can cast your lock on the next turn instead of paying the extra commander tax for it. We also have Nizumi Grave Robber, which we can pay one and a black to remove a creature card from an opponent's graveyard. And if no cards are in that graveyard, we flip him. And then when he flips, we can pay four and a black to put a creature card from a graveyard into play under our control, which means we can sink a whole bunch of mana to this and we can take some advantage out of it by having some graveyard hate as well as put taking advantage of players that have a lot of creatures in their graveyards next we have soul of chandelar which has two abilities that are both basically the same one is pay three and two red it deals three damage to target player and three damage to up to one target creature that player controls and then the other one is the same but you have to exile it from your graveyard in order to activate that one more time again another mana sink and it lets us deal damage directly to our players kind of redirecting that mana burn that would have been dealt to us to elder people, which is very nice. And then the last of my creature mana sinks is Walking Ballista. It costs XX, which means we can pay any amount of mana into it as long as it's an even amount. And not only that, but when it is on the battlefield, we can pay mana to add more plus one plus one counters to it, which means it's all around just a perfect mana sink for this deck. Moving on to our sorceries, we have Diabolic Revelation, which is a, a nuts card. You can pay X, three, and two black to search your library for up to X cards, put them into your hand, and then shuffle your library. So we can put an infinite amount of mana into this spell and get all of the pieces that we would want from our deck we don't have to grab that many cards so we can pump more than the 99 into this spell to cast it and this is a great way to close out the game especially if we have all of that mana laying around that can be the thing that we need to find the thing that we're missing on the battlefield we also have exsanguinate torment of hailfire and comet storm all of which we can pump a ton of mana into x and then deal a lot of damage, make people lose life, make them sacrifice creatures, all of the works to basically end the game before that mana burn even has the chance to hit them, so we can get around the mana burn affecting us as well. Next we have Goblin Cannon, which has an ability that costs two, and it says Goblin Cannon deals one damage to target creature or player, and then we sacrifice Goblin Cannon. We can activate this as many times as we want on the stack, as long as we have the mana to pay for it. So if we have infinite mana, then we can just put all of it into Goblin Cannon at the same time, and, and all of those triggers will go on the stack before you sacrifice Goblin Cannon. And then after the first one resolves, it doesn't matter if it's there, all of those triggers are still on the stack. Next, we have Planar Bridge, which isn't exactly a mana sink in the traditional sense, but it does cost a lot of mana. It costs six to cast and then eight to tap. It's a great way to get rid of a whole bunch of mana at once and lets us search our library for a permanent and put it onto the battlefield. And we've got lots of enchantments and artifacts and creatures that we can use to take advantage of Planar Bridge. The next three cards are sort of win cons in the deck, and those are Staff of Domination, Sword of the Perunes, and Umbral Mantle. Each of these, in their own way, lets you untap your lock, which means that you can activate his ability again as long as you continue to have that mana. And what better way to produce all of that mana than your lock himself and one of our mana doublers? Because if your lock is producing four or five mana, we're going to come out even with all of these untapped shenanigans. Sword of the Perunes might be the best one in the deck simply because it acts as a mana sink all on its own and we only need four mana to keep it going. Umbral Manta, you have to untap your lock so if you can't tap it then it's over and staff of domination requires five mana in total to be neutral with your lock so in any of these cases if you have a mana doubler one of these three artifacts and your lock out you can tap your lock infinite times and as long as you have something to sink the mana to on your side you can just let the turn run out and your opponents will all die to the mana burn 
Next, we have Asceticism, which will give all of our creatures Hexproof, and for one and a green, we can regenerate a creature, which will help us keep your luck on the board, and it's a good mana sink like the others. Next is Helix Pinnacle, which is an all-star mana sink. It's basically the epitome of a mana sink. If you can sink 100 mana into Helix Pinnacle and keep it around until the beginning of your next turn, then you just win the game. So this is an alternate win con in this deck, and I've never found a deck where I've been able to pull this off more consistently whenever I put it onto the battlefield than in your lock, because your lock just generates an insane amount of mana, and you can pay any amount of that mana anytime you want into Helix Pinnacle, and it gets around the mana burn perfectly. And then last, we have Crawling Barons, a land that lets you put two plus one plus one counters on it for four mana and then it becomes a creature until the end of turn but you can continue to activate that ability as many times as you want and as many times as you can to sink as much mana as you want into that and if worse comes to worse you're gonna have a really really big land so that helps to end the game as well all right we've gone through the meat of the deck let's talk about the utility cards let's start with our ramp and I want to start with Animus Awakening here because it is a mana sink in itself. The beauty of it is that if you pump infinite mana into Animus Awakening, you basically just get every single land in your library and it's highly likely that you're going to have two or more instants or sorceries in your graveyard by then, which means that you can just untap all of those and that gives you even more mana if you even need it at that point, but it's just another mana sink option if you need it. We then have Dryad of the Elysian Grove and Chromatic Orrery. Both of them are just here for fixing our mana. We're in three colors, so sometimes we're missing the colors that we need. And with the amount of mana that we're going to have, it's it's crucial that we have the right colors. We then have some classic green ramp spells with Cultivate, Farseek, Kodama's Reach, Sky Shroud Claim, and Haro, all of which are pretty efficient at searching our library. And I love Sky Shroud Claim because it will search us up some shock lands and fix our mana almost 100% of the time. And then for some mana rocks, we have Arcane Signet, Golgari Signet, Gruul Signet, Rakdos Signet, and Soul Ring. I've included a sizable amount of ramp in here because we want to make sure that we are hitting your lock as fast as we can and getting the mana burn train going. And that's especially important because we don't have a lot of creatures in this deck. We have 16 total, including your lock, which means if someone is attacking us with their creatures, we're going to be mostly defenseless, so we need to be very fast about our mana burn strategy, and these ramp pieces are important. Next, let's move on to our card draw, and my first two picks here are Eidolon of Blossoms and Satessin Champion, both of which will draw as a card every time an enchantment enters the battlefield. We actually have more enchantments in this deck than we do creatures, so I thought it fitting to have some enchantress effects in here, even though the enchantments aren't really the main focus of the deck, just because a fifth of our deck is enchantments, it's going to be pretty easy to get cards off of these spells. We then have Magus of the Wheel and Wheel of Fate, both of which are pretty good wheel effects. And then Valakut Awakening, which will allow us to cycle away any number of cards that we want and draw that many plus one, or it can be a land if we are in need of a red land. And last, we have Phyrexian Arena because it's such good card draw in black, basically letting us draw an additional card at the beginning of our turn in exchange for one life. Our second to last section is our interaction and protection section. Let's start with our board wipes. We have Blasphemous Act and Toxic Deluge. Both are just great in Jun colors and will help us control the board, especially against heavy creature strategies. For targeted removal, we have Assassin's Trophy, Beast Within, and Chaos Warp. Again, all of these are all-stars in the colors that they're in, and they're almost the best we can do without white or blue in our color identity. Next, we have Clothis, God of Destiny, which is kind of an all-around card. It has some graveyard hate on it, it has some ramp on it, and it has some direct damage on it, all of which are very useful in this deck and it's just a really good gruel card to have in our deck. Next we have Glorious End and Sundial of the Infinite, two cards that really work well with our strategy because we want to be ending the turn when other people have a lot of mana in their mana pool 
and then make that all empty from their mana pool. So these will help us end the turn before someone has the chance to interact with us or get rid of your lock or something. And and these happen to be the only two cards in this mana identity that can do this kind of effect. So very important to have in our deck, even with Glorious End's caveat of making us lose the game if we don't win the game by the end of our turn. Next, I have Pyroblast and Red Elemental Blast, the two best red counter spells just helping us to combat other people's counter spells and cyclonic rifts that could threaten our board. And then for protection, we have Vines of Vastwood and Swiftfoot Boots. Vines of Vastwood is very good instant protection for our commander, and Swiftfoot Boots, we can stick on your lock and he'll be protected from everybody else's spells. And last, let's go over our mana base. We've kept it pretty simple. We have Jund Panorama for our fetch land, Overgrown Tomb, Stomping Ground, and Cinder Glade as lands that we can tutor up with Sky Shroud Claim, Savage Lands as a tri land, Reliquary Tower if we end up getting a lot of cards in our hand, and then nine forests, nine mountains, and six swamps. Didn't want to rely too much on our non basic lands, especially because we have a Blood Moon in this deck, and I'm always worried that we're just going to screw ourselves over with that. But we don't have to worry too much because your lot can generate the extra colors that we need as well. Thank you so much for watching this deck tech on your lock of Scorched Thrash. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to our channel. We have a lot of deck decks like this, and I'm sure that you will enjoy many of our other ones if you like this one. Stay tuned for more Commander Legends spoilers and deck techs coming out in the next couple of weeks as we continue to see more commanders from this set revealed and get our brewing engines going. If you want to support us directly, head on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley to sign up today. We have exclusive content, Discord, merch, and you get to talk to us all day about these amazing spoilers that are coming out. So sign up today. It's a lot of fun for everyone involved. Thank you again to GameGrid for sponsoring this episode and all of our episodes on this channel. If you go through the link in the description, it will help the channel because it's an affiliate link and w and they ship nationwide so you can get your Commander Legends singles there and support the channel while doing it. We have live streams every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Join us for some Brawl on Arena and check out our social media. We have links to all of this in the description below. Thanks again for watching this episode and have a wonderful weekend.